Okay, let's do this. Let's start this webinar. And this webinar is about super app development, which is made easy with Repack. Uh, our agenda for today is going to be explaining what is super app and what has Repack got to do with it. Uh, we're gonna show you our super app template demo. Uh, Rafix will walk us through the newest and greatest developments that are happening within Repack itself. And then, like I already mentioned, we will go through Q&A discussions, which you can ask questions already. When you go to the slido.com and enter this code or go through this QR code or during any time in this presentation, uh, click on the messages that Marta is posting in webinar chat, you will get here. And here you can ask your question, send it, and upvote uh, some questions uh, that you feel deserve answering, like codes for React Native EU 2023, please. I'm not sure if we have those, but... Uh, I will ask my colleague Marta to work something behind the scenes. And maybe for those of you who will stay with us uh, until the end of this uh, webinar, uh, we will do the giveaway of, uh, of codes for React Native EU 2023. I really like this question. I upvoted it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, please. Post your questions during whole presentation. We will be glad to answer all of them or the most upvoted ones, at least. And this webinar is presented by Callstack. Me and my colleagues on this call, on this webinar, we are all software engineers at Callstack. Uh, starting with Kuba Romanczyk, can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us why are you here? Uh, so, hey, I'm uh, Kuba, and I'm, uh, as Wukash mentioned, it, uh, a software engineer here at Kostak, and I'm a co-creator of the Super App Showcase, uh, and uh, I also authored uh, most of the latest features in Repack. Okay, thank you. Good to have you here. And uh, Rafał Zakrzewski, uh, Rafix, who are you? Hello. Um, so, uh, I'm here uh, as kind of like two persons at the same time on one <laughs> hand i'm a repack maintainer um and i'm like tracking the issues and, and trying to 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 make sure that we deliver the best code possible and we address any issues that that happen and on the other hand uh on a daily basis i'm working for a client uh our call stack um who is uh heavily invested into repack and module federation architecture and i have some hands-on experience with with repack so i'm not only a maintainer but also uh practitioner i can see yeah you are a user of this uh tool belt of this utility that's me and Łukasz Ludziński is me i'm Łukasz. uh i'm a software engineer at Callstack, and also i'm a host of the react native show podcast on this very like youtube channel if you watch it on youtube you can watch uh, some of our episodes um and i have nothing to do with repack but i guess that gives me a unique experience in this group to talk about the noob experience for Repack. So let's see how that goes. I'm going to be hosting this session. And about the session, let's go to our agenda and start with super apps and Repack. Kuba, uh, what are the super apps? So super app is an app that combines multiple services or functionalities together, which aren't necessarily connected, like messaging or payments. Each of these functionalities could be a separate uh, app on its own, but instead they're all combined into this one big app that we can call a super app. The goal of the super apps is to be the only app that you need on the daily basis. It's worth mentioning that it's not a strictly defined term, but more of a buzzword that we use around. And uh, yeah, moving on to another side, um, uh, the the biggest uh, super apps that we have currently out there are mostly on the Asian market and uh, WeChat is considered the biggest super app uh, 
in the East and has over a billion daily users. Uh, we also have Grab, which advertises itself as everyday everything app, and Momo, which is a popular e-wallet app, uh, e -wallet app in Vietnam. And all of these apps started with their main functionality, which, for example, for WeChat was messaging. Um, and they kind of pivoted and created other functionalities that they also bundled into their app. And that's how they became super apps. Okay. And um, in the West, uh, we have those two apps, as you can see on the screen, the Facebook and Uber, which main functionality for Facebook is, of course, being social media uh, application. But at the same time, they have uh, now a dating uh, functionality and also since many years ago they have a marketplace which is written in react native so you can say that facebook has those mini apps embedded inside it and is as well a super app of some kind and uber as well uh, apart from being um right hailing um application you can order food within uber and also you can have uber foods as a separate app which is a definition, I guess, like a part of the super apps uh, environment. Yep, that's exactly right. So what is the um, architecture that all of those applications have in common? So there's no one way to create a super app as it doesn't matter what technologies or architecture you use. As you can see, super apps are architecture agnostic and we want to show you our way to approach super apps with Repack and Module Federation. Um, so, Lukasz, could you please tell us, as a developer not directly uh, involved in Repack development, what Repack means to you? Yeah, okay. So, uh, when I first joined Callstack two years ago, um, I've heard about Repack and I know what it is. And the main functionality of Repack is to allow developers to use different bundler than default bundler for React Native, which is Metro. Metro is default bundler for React Native. But if you want to do some more things, you can, with Repack, use Webpack, which is a bundler for web and has a huge community, has a big plugin ecosystem and we have a separate episode of the react native show podcast with uh, zach jackson talking about uh, webpack and repack and i hope we can link it maybe in the chat or maybe um, later but that's the main functionality of repack is to enable us to use webpack but what it also enables is usage of module federation which we can uh, use to download some chunks from remote to our application, which enables this whole super apps ecosystem. I don't have to bundle everything together in my app. I can allow different teams to work on different functionalities in different time, and I can remotely download the, their work into my main app. So I guess that's what we'll be talking about here in this webinar. That's exactly right. Um, so we wanted to highlight that we recently released our very own template of a super app built with Repack and Module Federation called Super App Showcase, which is already made public on GitHub. And the goal of this project was to create a maintainable project structure that can be uh, used as an inspiration to creating your own super apps. Um, and all of that uh, we have uh, inside of the monorepo, but we want to stress out that monorepo is not a requirement when it comes to super apps and it's an optional step. And we also have an example where one of the mini app that actually is inside of this super app uh, in this showcase is uh, outside of the main repository and, uh, uh, and shows how it can be utilized um, in terms of the super apps. Uh, so now let's uh, let's move to the super app showcase demo. 
Yeah, I will ask uh, Kuba to take the screen share uh, for this purpose. And I also want to say that the important part is that we can also use the mini apps inside the super app, but also we can set them up so they work independently as a separate application. Yep, that's that's exactly right. Um, so uh, to the left, uh, you can see the architecture diagram of our super app monorepo and the user repository to the right. And uh, pay for the for this demo, please pay no attention to the shell that's on the left because that's that's a functionality that that we won't discuss during this demo. Um, so let's get started. And as you can see, we are on the welcome screen, and that screen is actually a sign-in screen that comes from the AUF mini app. Uh, and um, and yeah, let's proceed and see uh, what other. And now we can see the dashboard, which is, um, oh, one more thing, just pay no attention to the design. All we want to highlight in here is just architecture and uh, and how all these mini apps come together to create the super app. So one word about the design. I think we can say that uh, the UI library used in the showcase is React Native Paper. So big shout out to Ryu, yep. who's the maintainer of that library. Um, all right, going back to the demo, um, we move on to the services tab where we can see all different mini apps that are uh, part of the super app. And uh, moving on to, if I click on any of these tiles, we'll be moved to the separate navigator that actually is exposed and comes from the uh, different app. Now, let's see how that looks for the booking. And we are in a completely separate app that's also embedded into the super app. The same is the same goes for shopping. And just the same for the news mini app. And but that one, please be reminded that comes from another repository, uh, but still works just the same. And finally, we have the dashboard mini app. And that concludes our demo. Uh, what I want to say is that <clears throat> it's really interesting how you look at the app on the right and it doesn't look like it is built in any different way than like a normal regular application. It works uh, the same and user doesn't have to know the difference, the, the underlying architecture choices. But on the left-hand side, the architecture overview looks super complicated. <laughs> so yeah, I, I wanted just to say that. Yeah, I think that it's one of the benefits is that from the user perspective, there's no real difference. Maybe besides a few like loader screens or spinners when we actually fetch the, the remote bundles or the federate modules um, in terms of module federation architecture. Uh, and the the the, the con of it is the complex architecture, as we can see on the diagram, as you said, uh, but we get a lot of benefits coming from it. And uh, I, I, the, the list of benefits, uh, it's it's pretty huge, but the, the main point, I think, uh, and, and the main seller here uh, is that um, you can have uh, separate independent teams working on a separate set of features. Uh, and it was like the main selling point for uh, for the client that I'm working for in Colstack. Uh, that decided to invest into this technology. Uh, you can have separate teams work in a separate set of features independently, and then uh, by leveraging module federation, combine them in whatever combination you want. So you can have news repository, the news app, uh, built as a standalone app, deployed uh, to the app store. Uh, but if there's a business decision that you, for whatever reason, want to use part of that app, or even the whole app inside another app, you can do that pretty easily. I would yeah. uh, and without repack, you would have to re-implement everything basically, or just copy the code to the to the other app, which is obviously not a good idea. So I think that's the that's the main benefit of the uh, of the architecture. Even though that it's complex, it saves a lot of time, uh, development time in the end. Yeah, but, but exactly, I, it's not a 
not a solution without its comes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and also maybe this complex architecture, we are explaining it right now. We are like preparing the template so that it is understandable and it is uh, in some kind of cohesive way. Well, but just looking at the diagram, you you still need to take a second to actually understand what's going on, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the second, the second uh, main advantage of it is the over the air update. So let's say you have a host app uh, uh, that is deployed in the store, uh, and this host app is using the news, right? Part of the news app. Um, and um, with Repack, uh, if there is an update to the JavaScript side of the news app, you can just deploy this new version and pull it uh, into the, the host app without uh, having to go through the new normal release process. So it's it's working, it's kind of addressing the similar point as a code push. Yeah, so lastly, I just wanted to mention that we are still developing the uh, Super App Showcase and you can expect that new features will arrive there shortly. Uh, so just stay tuned for updates. Okay. Um, thank you, Kuba, for this nice demo. I'm going to take the screen sharing now and go back to our presentation. That was our uh, super app showcase demo. I want to remind everyone that uh, Marta is posting constantly in the chat that you can go to slider.com and post your questions if you have any for uh, this demo. If you want to know some more, please let us know. Okay. And... On our agenda right now is the newest and greatest in Repack 3.2.0, so Rafix. Yeah, um, so recently, two weeks ago, around two weeks ago, we released final version of 3.2.0 of Repack. Uh, it was preceded by two release candidates and which we like kind of tweaked the APIs and, and like made sure that it's the best implementation uh, possible. And the two main... Uh, features of this new release uh, are code signing and remote assets. So I think we can start with code signing um, because it's it's really important, uh, especially in the in the big enterprises, the security has to come first. Um, and uh, if we can move to the next slide, Lukas, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So as I said, uh, in the big enterprises, security is a must. So uh, we wanted to make sure that there is a built-in uh, solution, a built-in way in the repack that enables us to ensure uh, better security of, of, of the apps built using Repack. Um, so we decided to use a like an algorithm, a way to, to sign the code that is widely used in the industry and in app distribution. Uh, apps in the, the App Store, Apple App Store and Google Play Store are, are using the similar technique to, to make sure that the code that the end user is getting is actually the code that the app developer wanted them to get without any malicious uh, tampering of the code or, or, or so on. Uh, and also we, uh, we we kind of uh, implemented in a similar way to the code push, uh, which is uh, sometimes mentioned uh, like alternative to repack, which is actually not, but it's trying to, it's working the same waters basically. So um, without intro to what code signing does on a high level, uh, I think we can go to Kuba who actually implemented most of it and talk about what the code sign is actually trying to prevent yeah, so there are basically three types of attack that we want to prevent with uh, code signing. The first one is tampering with our uh, with our code in the bundle, right? So uh, code signing can prevent tampering attacks by ensuring that the software code has not been altered by the unauthorized parties. Uh, if an attacker modifies the code, the digital signature will be invalidated, warning users that the software has been tampered with. Um, another type of attack is spoofing. So spoofing is uh, when someone poses as a legitimate authority delivering software, but is actually uh, someone with malicious intents. So code signing can also prevent that because um, we verify that the uh, signature matches the one we uh, we created with our private key. As long as we don't leave the private key. Right? Exactly. The weakest uh, link in all of that is is the private key. So uh, if if it's leaked, then it's basically it's better to take that uh, code uh, of the CDN. Um, uh, right, and the last type of attack is man in the middle attack, uh, where someone could be 
uh, eavesdropping on the conversation and could modify the responses and also tamper with the bundle. Um, okay, so moving on to, uh, uh, let's go over the process of how code signing works in the context of bundles produced by Repack. Uh, as you might know, the process of bundling in Repack is called compilation, and it's the same in Webpack because it's Repack is just a wrapper around Webpack in the end. Um, so the code signing process happens at the, at the very end of the compilation where bundles have their final shape. We then take the content, contents of each bundle and create a hash out of it. We take that hash and we embed it into the bundles in form of GWTs signed with a private key. At this moment, we have a signed bundles that can be used in the super app. Uh, then moving on to the client side, when we download that bundle, we first we split that bundle into two parts. We have the code part and the signature part. Uh, we first analyze the signature, whether it was indeed signed with the private key we expected to by comparing it uh, with the public key, well, not really comparing, but uh, utilizing the public key in, in, uh, in verifying that the signature was uh, indeed uh, what we expected to. Um, and that public key is embedded into the app uh, downloading that bundle. Uh, so after we finish with that, and it goes without errors. We then move to comparing the uh, hash of the bundle that we actually downloaded by generating it again uh, with the hash that's inside of the JWT that we sent over with the bundle. Uh, and if all of that goes without the hitch, we know that it's the bundle that we are looking for and uh, we can proceed and uh, load that bundle into our app. Uh, I, it all sounds good, and I, and I like I want to repeat back that security is the top priority, and whatever it takes to ensure the security, we should do this. Uh, but what you just described sounds like there's a lot of happening uh, during the build time, and then during the runtime when the when the client needs to decode all the stuff. Um, is there like over performance overhead for for doing that, or mm, so when it comes to build time, there's little to a very little overhead, although we do the hashing and creation of the GWT uh, in the in the GS, uh, it doesn't really matter as it only adds like, um, in the end there are like, uh, usually there are like 10 bundles at most. Uh, perhaps in bigger apps, this could be, this number could be bigger, but it's usually around 10 in our case. And it's done on the, on the either the developer machine or on the CI, so the machine is pretty beefy, so it should yeah. not have problems yeah. with doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So very little to no overhead. And when it comes to client, we do uh, all of that, um, you could say decoding uh, on the native side. So, um, so the most uh, kind of, um, performance intensive process would be creating the hash of that bundle, right? But our fonts have um, hardware acceleration for cryptographic functions. So that should be very fast and there should be little to no overhead when loading that bundle. In the end, the, the biggest, uh, uh, the slowest part of downloading the bundle would be the network transfer itself. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's not adding any overheads or a little. Okay. Uh, should I go on to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can sum up the the, the first feature of the Repack 3.0 code signing. So um, we are sorry, but for now, there's no documentation available soon. We are working on it and we plan to release it as soon as possible as it's done and it's comprehensive enough to, to, to be a good documentation. Uh, if you want to use it, uh, experiment with code signing or like try to use it in your demo app or whatever. Uh, there is a the link to the pull request that actually uh, was based for the implementation of code signing, and there's a usage section in the in the description of that PR. So it tells you what you need to do in the what you need to change in the Webpack config. It tells you what you need to add to to the app, like the public key mentioned, uh, and basically walks you through all the things necessary to use to leverage the code signing. And uh, going back to the things that we want to add, uh, what we want to update in the super app showcase, uh, code signing is one of them. So we want to provide a 
like state of the art uh, implementation of code signing in terms of the super app uh, showcase. So you can base your implementation off of that. And I think we can, uh, yeah, move to the to the next big feature, uh, long awaited feature. So remote assets. Um, uh, historically, if you go through the issues in the in the repack, you can see a lot of them uh, asking, how can I uh, make sure that the assets from the federated modules, so the modules fetched dynamically remotely to the super app, uh, are actually being fetched? The how we can make the assets land in the in the host app. So uh, before repack to that to that zero, it was pretty hard to do. So you either had to uh, implement like your custom way to 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 go around that which is obviously not a good thing because then you have to maintain it uh, and it's always the best way to, to to have it built in into the tool um and there was another uh solution which Nicola will mention in a bit um so we decided that we need to implement it inside the repack so we have a built uh, in way to 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 address the remote assets problem so i think we can move to the next slide and discuss the the history about it um yeah so before the update uh, 3.2.0 of repack uh, we only had basically one way to load the um load the assets if you wanted to utilize module, uh, module federation uh, so and that was inlining all of the assets into the bundle so inlining means that basically uh, for example if we had an image we needed to convert it to a a 64 string and then just put that string into the bundle and uh, that is a very that is still viable but inefficient solution because uh, the bundle size grows greatly and the base 64 representation of, of that image is way bigger than it would be uh, as for example in a png format uh, the other method that could also work for the module federation but wasn't officially supported was that you could actually, uh, if you had a host host app and mini app, you could uh, take all of the assets from the mini app, put it into the host app, and then uh, with a little bit of tweaking of Reaper code base, you could actually um, load these assets uh, as if they were local ones because you already prepackaged them into the main app, right? But that wasn't officially supported as we don't believe it's not a maintainable way to go around uh, handling the assets. Yeah, let's let's talk about the the pros and cons of the remote assets because, like, with every great uh, feature, there comes some trade-offs of it. Um, and I think uh, the pros like outweigh the uh, the cons. But yeah, let's let's talk about them so we have a clear picture here. Uh, all right. So the First pros is that in development, uh, when you are working with remote assets, it should be uh, basically the same experience as if you were working with local assets. Uh, it basically works uh, like that. So when uh, you have the assets locally uh, in, in your project and you load them locally, but when you convert them to remote assets in production, you actually... Um, you need to upload them to the CDN and then just download them as if they're remote in the first place. Um, we also save the information about the width and the height of the image. So there is no issue where you, you could probably remember that if you load uh, an image um, from a remote resource in React Native, you actually have to specify style and then uh, the width and height of that image. Otherwise, yeah. it will just not appear on the screen, right? Um, so I've stumbled upon that numerous times. Yeah. <laughs> and you actually don't have to do that. We save that information during the bundling process, so it's all taken care of. Um, and yeah, so overall, uh, the, the biggest uh, pros, I think, is that uh, as we don't bundle the assets uh, at uh, compile time uh, and we move them to the CDN, we have small bundle that has a better startup time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that solution isn't without the cons. So, um, so the biggest con, I guess, is that, well, you actually need to load these images. Uh, so you should probably play, uh, 
use some default placeholder for that image or a fallback image, as well as utilize some loading state, I suppose. Um, but image component can take care of that basically out of the box. So there is no need to yeah. some and there are, custom static hooks. Right? Yeah, but there are like, uh, for example, you can use React Native Fast Image if you want to uh, build on top of this solution. And I don't know, for example, prefetch all the assets for the first screen of the mini app that you're downloading, right? So the user don't have to wait. Um, besides waiting for JS code, the user don't have to wait for the images to load. You can oh, yeah, prefetch yeah. them. Yeah, you could absolutely do that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good base to, to build on top of it. Yeah. Um, and so the second con is that uh, as we as these assets will be uploaded to the CDN uh, um, in the end, we need to know the address of that CDN beforehand at build time so we can place that U, final URLs into the bundle. Yeah, because it's all happening in the build time, right? Yep. Okay. And then you have to care about how much your file weighs in That's order not always. to download the 10 max or something of the image, right? Yeah. yeah. That's that's always true for basically all the assets, right? Yeah, you always want <laughs> yeah. bundle, always optimize assets the smallest as possible. Yeah. So one last thing we wanted to talk about uh, about when it comes to remote assets is that we included automatic scale resolution for scaled assets, and what it means that, for example, if you have locally three uh, three sizes of an asset. Uh, and you convert these to remote ones, um, Repack will do scale resolution uh, in the runtime of the client's app, and it will check what scale it needs, and it will use that URL to actually download the, the needed assets. So um, we don't need to download all the scales, and, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Also for saving the network. Uh, yeah, traffic, yeah. Yep. Basically. Um, so, yeah, to sum up the remote assets, um, when with code signing, we didn't have uh, the, 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 the documentation page with remote assets we have. So, you can visit it now uh, or you can re reference the PR because it also has the, the usage section. But I, I think this uh, docs page is uh, more comprehensive. Um, and there you can see. Uh, all the things you need to configure uh, in order to 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 use the remote assets, uh, basically to configure the assets loader so it enables remote assets, the Webpack assets loader. Um, and uh, as I think this is uh, this is giving you a lot of control over what you can achieve. So be prepared that you probably would need to experiment with 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 these assets a bit in order to suit your use case, because uh, as usually with Webpack. There's a lot of things you can configure, and there that sometimes can be overwhelming. But the end result that you can get is 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 what you're what you're aiming for. Like it, you actually can tweak it to exactly match your needs, basically. So I think that that sums it up for remote assets. Uh, be sure to 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 check the 3.2.0. Um, all the feedback is welcome. If you if you have any troubles, any issues, just file them in the GitHub. And yeah, if you have any um, ideas how we can improve things do that as well yeah oh, well. create prs uh create issues uh give us feedback exactly exactly right okay uh thank you rafix thank you kuba we are done with the main portion of this webinar we are moving to a q a discussion i can see on my other screens that we have a lot of questions waiting for us there before we go there uh, I want to give some shout out to Chain React in Portland that is happening next week. Uh, we will have our own uh, head of technology, Mike Pieschawa, there on the stage talking about Repack and talking about super apps. So using this uh, discount code, you can get 10% discount on your ticket to Portland. Okay. And now I will move on to Slido.com. Uh, last chance to scan the QR code and we are done. <laughs> so, oh, okay. The first question. So 
we have a lot of questions. I'm not sure if we can uh, do all of them. So please upvote the questions that you want us to answer. And we will go one by one from the top. And the most upvoted questions, question right now is code for React Native EU 2023, please. So I was chatting with my colleagues from Colstack uh, on Slack in the background. And right now, I don't have good news for you. We don't have codes available right now. But if we will have it, we're going to send you uh, those codes, codes through email uh, for all the 29 attendees that uh, are on this call right now. We're going to send you the codes. So please be patient. Uh, go, going to the next question. How does Repack relate to Metro Bundler? Is it a full replacement? Um, so I, I think I can I can answer that. So Repack by itself, it's not a bundler. Uh, it's only uh, a tool belt toolkit. It's basically abstracts all the things that you need to do in order to use Webpack bundler in React Native world, basically, because it's uh, as the name suggests, Webpack is basically built for web. That was the the main intention for it in the beginning. Um, but to enable module federation, which has first class support and in the, in the in the webpack, uh, we wanted to change Metro and use webpack instead of Metro. So the webpack is the uh, Metro replacement, not the repack. Repack is just uh, like a toolkit that enables you to use webpack, and also it provides some other additional features like code signing and remote assets, uh, to name uh, these two. But uh, in module uh, federation. Uh, Repack does not replace Metro, Webpack does, but Repack enables usage of the of the Webpack. Yeah, but if you consider Repack as a package that you download, you could say that it, it is a bundle that replaces Metro. Yeah. In some sense. Yeah, in some sense, yeah. But to be precise, not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> uh, how to manage the deployment of mini app without violating play or app store guidelines? It's a hard one. Yeah, it's a hard one. It's a good one. Uh, and uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that we have a dedicated page in the Repack docs that addresses this specific question. So it provides you with a, a few like guidelines that you should follow in order to not violate the app store uh, or Google Play policy. And um, the, the 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 things are for example you should not use word uh, mini apps uh, in the in the code or in the user interface because that would uh, potentially threaten the um, Apple App Store you know hegemony in the in the App Store <laughs> world so they don't want to hear uh, mini apps you can say I don't know features or something like that uh, and also uh, be sure, like make sure that uh, when you submit your app for review process, you bundle all of the possible features and give credentials to the reviewers to uh, to, the, uh, to the account that has access to all these features, so they can review them because they you, you really you really don't want to um, not expose all the features to the reviewers because that potentially will be breaking the 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 guidelines and the terms of, of usage of the app stores. But uh, I, I I strongly suggest you go to the repack docs and, and check out the, the page there. It dives uh, into more details about it. Yeah, let me just add to one more uh, thing to that. Um, uh, the deployment of the mini app, well, it's you, you don't need to go through the review process again if you only release some kind of patch fixes. So that's, that's what the Module, module federation should be mostly used for uh, and not for new features because that could actually violate the um, store policy. Yeah, yeah. Well, whenever you introduce new mini app, uh, please be sure to, to go through a normal release process. Just don't include it into, into the app without the review process because that can... Which is a, also a good user experience. Yeah. Like in the release notes for your main application, you might want to say that we added this new huge feature and not just uh, have it uh, pop into the screens of users um, unexpectedly. I agree. 
Okay, uh, great question and great answers. So next one, can I deploy each module independently? I mean, using something like code push. So let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, code push uh, is like, you can use it together with Repack. It's not officially supported. At least that's what's stated in the docs, but I personally tried that uh, and it worked. Uh, so you can use them together, but they are trying to achieve different things. So the code push basically enables you to update the JavaScript of the main bundle you have. So like the core of your app, the, the, the core of the super app, the host app, whereas with module federation, you achieve similar capability like over the year updates, but for the mini apps. So it's kind of similar, but not fully. Um, but to answer the question, can you deploy each module independently? Yes, you can do that with module federation. And by mod, if you mean uh, by, by module, you mean mini app, you can, um, you can deploy them independently. You can update them independently um, for more advanced use cases. For example, if you have a um, two super apps and they uh, provide some native modules that the mini apps uh, need to use that they depend on, you can have like a proxy catalog server or whatever that decides uh, the versioning compatibility between the, the, the mini apps and host apps. So in more advanced use cases, you would probably need, uh, instead of just having a simple CDN that's providing you with the bundles, you'll have to have some kind of middleman that decides which version is compatible, which version of the mini app is compatible with which version of the, of the host app and so on. But, but to uh, answer uh, the question, yes, you can. Adding on top of that answer, this is one of the main selling points of Module Federation and of Repack. Independent teams working on independent modules and releasing independently. Yep. Uh, Amit, thank you for writing your name in the next question. Is it possible to pass any parameters from shell app to mini app? All right. So maybe I'll take that one. So... Uh... When you have a super app uh, and you want to import that mini app and actually display it in the app, uh, it will be imported and used as a normal React component, right? So in there, you could create uh, and pass any props that you want, really. And let me add uh, on top of that what you said. Uh, so while in theory, it's possible to, to pass as many props as you want, and practice you, and this comes from like the micro front ends architecture, not limitations, but uh, um, uh, like guidelines, the, the best practice, sorry. Best Design practice. decisions. Yeah. Um, you should pass only things that are absolutely necessary in order to avoid tightly coupling the, the shell app with mini apps, because mini apps can be used in the number of shell apps. And if you have tight coupling with host app A, uh, then it might not work well with the host app B, the mini app, I mean. So in theory, you can pass as much as you want, but you probably want to limit that uh, number of props and only pass extremely necessary things. And also you probably want to establish a clear uh, host app to mini app data interface so that every host app uh, in which you intend to use mini apps can provide the same set of props and then the mini apps will work without any problems. This is actually a great answer that opened a new discussion point, I think, because in the presentation previously in the webinar, we have not discussed that you can have several separate host app that actually uses the same mini app. So that's that's great. Yep, that's 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 completely possible. Uh, okay. A uh, question from Anonymous, who posted uh, most of the questions here. Is it possible to integrate Repack with Expo? I'd like to stay in Expo to build the super app quickly and to let developers of mini apps move quickly too. So the short answer is no, unfortunately, for the first time today. Um, uh, and this is because... Uh, you like Repack needs to to compile its own native code, and with Expo, it's not that simple to do so. Um, although, uh, if you want to experiment with it, you're like we are happy to support you in that. Uh, we I, I don't think we have it in our backlog at least anytime soon. 
um, to experiment with Expo. Uh, it might be possible. Officially, it's not supported. Well, I can tell you that we are uh, slowly experimenting with it. Oh, cool. In this sense. So maybe something might come out of it. That will be great. I think there's that would open uh, a, a huge amount of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen in the issues, uh, there were a few issues asking specifically about that using Repack with Expo. So yeah. that would be great if we can support that. I also want to say that if you really need this feature and if you are an enterprise that needs this feature, reach out to us and maybe we can experiment it on your demand. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it would be great to, to have that <laughs> embedded. Next question. If I have two modules that are using the same library, Sorry, the other question was upvoted first, so I'm going to jump into the questions with a question with four upvotes. Would it be dangerous to let mini apps access the device's secure store uh, keychain? Do mini apps have access to all libraries in the super app? Um, basically, the, the mini app uh, is just pure JavaScript. You cannot um, pack native code as a federated module because that's basically how, how, how the OS, uh, OS works. So when you, um, when you pull the JavaScript bundle, um, it's run in the same context uh, as the normal React Native app that you're running, the, the, the same context as the whole, whole step is running. So yes, you have access to pretty much anything that uh, the whole step provides. So uh, if you don't overwrite, for example, the context that uh, stores the Redux store, you would have access to the Redux store state in the mini app. But we don't recommend that because that will introduce tight coupling, of course, but it's possible. Um, so um, in theory, yes, uh, if that's, but that's possible. And I don't think it's dangerous because ultimately you have the control over uh, which mini apps you want to pull into the, the host app. Right? Yep. And yeah, so just to clarify, you can access all the libraries uh, which are in the host app. And well, uh, in terms of accessing the secure store, like Keychain, you could do that if there is a library in the host app that enables that functionality. Yeah, yeah. So maybe to clarify, um, if your mini app needs to use any native module, any library that has native code, you have to install this dependency in the host app and pretty much in every host app that will use that uh, mini app. So how about if I want to use this mini app as a standalone app and it has to use some native functionality, is that allowed? Yeah, yeah is that, that that's allowed because you build this uh, like a normal React Native app when it's stand, in, in, in standalone mode, so to speak. Uh, you can treat it as a normal React Native app. You can install native dependencies, but when you uh, build the the, the federated modules that you then consume in other apps, it's all, it's pure JavaScript. You cannot share native code that way. So in, in that case, you would have to install that na same native dependency in the host app. Okay. Okay. I think I understand. Uh, I think some question was upvoted to four upvotes. Yes, it's here. How many apps have been deployed using Repack? Impossible to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't have numbers. Uh, I don't think any one of us has the numbers. Yeah, so. I suppose that's the only answer we could actually give. But uh, Rafix, you were saying that you work on production application for a client, enterprise client that actually use Repack. So that's one. Um, actually, uh, it's not yet in production. We're doing like a... We have a separate um, branch and environment in which we are experimenting with it because it's a big enterprise client. We don't want to rush things. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not deployed to production in, in our case. But I think we have some uh, case studies in the in, in our block, in the call stack block um, of the apps that use Repack and have production deployments. Yeah, we were showing on some previous slides the Momo application 
which is uh, mentioned on our blog. And Marta, uh, can you please post the link to that uh, case study in the chat? And we will, we're gonna um, attach this to the email after this webinar as well. Uh, okay, moving on. So parameters deployed, export, dangerous. Okay, this question that I started to say and has three upvotes. If I have two modules that are using the same libra library, will this library be shared between these two modules or it will duplicate it in each module? I think I can answer that. Um, so I think what um, what somebody meant uh, by that question is um, whether we can actually have multiple versions of the same library running uh, in the host app. And the answer is, uh, Kind of yes, but uh, it depends. It only it only works for the JS libraries. That could work, uh, but if you have uh, a library that has some native parts, you kind of have to declare it as a singleton. Otherwise, uh, I think the, I think the app will, will keep crashing. Yeah, especially if, if you don't it, resolve if, that conflict, right? Yeah. If for example, if if you use if the dependency is uh, has um native uh view then the app will crash because with an error that you cannot register two native views with the same name uh for example yeah, something like that. um so you 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 probably should not have i don't know two versions of the react navigation at the same time um but you can specify um the required version um in that, the webpack config yeah in the webpack config and if the versions, for example, if you have, I don't know, let's treat Lodash as an example, right? Uh, if you, if the host app provides Lodash dependency and you mark it uh, in the webpack config and the mini app also needs Lodash, when you are pulling the JavaScript bundles of the mini app to the host app, um, you won't pull the Lodash code because webpack and module federation plugin is smart enough that it will know that like the host app fetching the mini app will know that it already provides the loadash so it can reuse that loadash so there's no duplication if you set it up correctly yep okay uh thank you very detailed answer i think we still have four minutes in this webinar so we probably won't go through all of the uh, questions uh, guys if we can speed up some of the answers we can go through as many as we can in the next three minutes okay okay turbo yeah, mode. Right. okay turbo mode are there plans to build infrastructure for hosting mini apps or does that burden fall on all us developers um so there's there's a exemplary implementation of the infrastructure in the uh, super app showcase um and i let kuba answer this because he's the part of r and uh, and i'm only the maintainer yeah, so we are currently working on uh, showing you how you could uh, create a CI CD pipeline uh, on GitHub, which uh, would actually bring all of this together and, uh, and enable you to release uh, very rapidly. Yeah, basically, okay. we have this in the back of our minds, but I don't think there's like any. It's currently a work in progress, but. Um, it should be available quite soon, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Can I use Repack on my normal React Native development or it's when I want to build a super app only? You should not use Repack in your day-to-day -day development. If you can use Metro and you have no issues using Metro, you should not switch to using Repack or Webpack. This is for very specific hardcore use, use cases. Uh, yeah, only. Or if you really want to use Webpack, you can, but only if you really like and want to use Webpack. Uh, I am a React Native front end engineer, and I'm curious as what to as to what Repack can do. With Repack, you can use Webpack in your React Native development, and with that, you can use Module Federation and create super apps. Is loading mini apps dynamically safe without the browser governing secure transport? Hmm. 
Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I think that code signing kind of answers it. Um, yeah, it kind of solves the security of the transport, right? Yeah, so it's safe with this version of Repack. It's not safe in the previous versions, but with 3, 2, 0, oh, it's safe finally. Uh, although there is no documentation about this. So yeah, stick around for some documentation coming soon. Uh, how to manage the remote chunks and where to host these chunks. Uh, yeah, so that's the question. Some remote server? Um, yeah, so the, the easiest way is to, when you when you build the, the production version of, of your bundles, you have like a generate folder in the directory and you can just pull, pull everything from there, every JavaScript bundle file and upload it to CDN. And then in the host app, you need to point the, the script manager coming from Repack to this CDN destination um, and it will work. In more advanced cases, you probably want to, as I mentioned before, you probably want to have some kind of proxy catalog server, whatever you want to call it, that will um, take care of deciding the, the, the version compatibility between mini apps and, and everything else. But to start, you can just upload it to a CDN or actually you can just pull it from GitHub, for example. Uh, for the context, I would just mention that you can see what catalog server actually is if you visit the super app showcase repository. Exactly. That, that there's an exemplary implementation of this exactly there. Okay. I'm going to, we are on time, but I'm going to read the next questions anyway. Uh, just one or two. This session will be shared. Yes. Marta just responded that we will share the recording and slides. What's the reason creating own super apps? There are several ones in China, as far as I know. So the reason you could be creating a super app, maybe not from scratch, but you could migrate to a super app if you're if you feel like your development is slowing down and you're releasing and you have a huge team working on it. So that's one way super app could be beneficial if you split it into um into micro front ends and actually utilize that to speed up your development but it requires a lot of coordination and, and learning yeah i think that the, the main takeaway here is that if you don't feel like your current setup current development base or like any every, something is wrong in your organization if you don't feel like that's the case you probably should not move to repack it has a lot of advantages, but you need to have a specific use case. So a big scale of the app, uh, multiple apps that you maybe want to share some codes uh, between. Um, there are a lot of this specific use cases that Repack really shines in. Uh, but if you don't have the specific needs, you probably should not use Repack. And let's wrap it up by saying yeah, that. Exactly. Choose the right tool for the job. We are wrapping up this question and we are wrapping up this webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Rafix, and thank you so much, Kuba. Thank you so much, Marta, our moderator on this call, and uh, for moderating on the questions and for writing uh, things in the webinar chat. That was our Q&A. Uh, thank you, everyone who stayed with us till the end. Uh, thank you so much. See you next time. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. See you.